Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm always excited to spend time in the Word. I love the Word, and the Word is so multidimensional. We are busy with a series on deception, and this is the ses second session um, on the series of deception. We have last month, we did a first session that we called the danger of deception. And my aim is to work through scripture to unpack scripture i'm not reading other books to try and understand deception at this stage for me it's important to get it from the word and to unpack it from the word so that we may be sure that we don't speak of an interpretation of scripture but that we speak from scripture itself so i really believe that as we go through this series and i don't know how long it's going to be there's so many different things that's on my heart that I have looked at in the past and am still looking at. So I just want to um, urge you to be patient as we go through it systematically. And we will be placing it on YouTube and the link will always be made available on our UPF WhatsApp group for those that want to go back and reference the teachings. I think it's good for us to work through it very systematically and have a conversation about what scripture says. So tonight we will continue looking at the basics of deception and i hope from next month we'll be able to get into more details um, firstly just a summary of what we looked at last time uh, we looked at the warnings that christ gave that paul gave and that john gave concerning deception in the new testament and in the new testament era um, it's it's really amazing to see how much was written about this problem in the church and last time we spoke about the importance of not ignoring the warnings that was given to us by Jesus himself and by the apostles. So last time we looked just as a summary where Jesus warned us that there will be many that say, I am the Christ. And we referenced that the word Christ means anointed. We looked at his references to false prophets that will arise that he especially mentioned in the end of the age. We looked at Paul's warnings where he said that we needed to be wise and that we needed to understand the will of God, that we are all deceivable because of our carnal nature, because of Satan that wants to deceive us and because of the world that is deceiving us. And then also because of false ministers that will arise to deceive us. And Paul specifically spoke about already in the first century church. Then we looked at John's warnings. Also, again, he referenced the last days. He spoke about liars and the antichrists that will arise. And he referenced especially the fact that they will be denying and contradicting the son and the father. Tonight, we will start by looking at what Peter wrote um, concerning deception. And then we will start slowly start working through other concepts. I want us to turn to 2 Peter 2 to see what uh, Peter wrote concerning this problem in the church now remember that the different chapters that we have in scripture were not there they were not written that way um, so just to give you some background what peter was talking about in second peter one before we get to verse one of second peter two is where paul where peter spoke about the fact that the prophecies of the old testament is a confirmation of what god did through jesus christ and then he says that prophecy is not something for own interpretation but that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and cannot be understood by your own interpretation. And then he moves into this verse in verse one, where Peter says, but there were also false prophets among the people, referencing that, that which has gone before them. Remember when we looked at the uh, concept of false prophet in the Greek, that term means um, pretended foretellers or religious imposters. So Peter says that these always existed, but then he goes on to say that even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Firstly, we must understand this is the only reference that we get to the word false teacher. I've looked in the New Testament, the word false teacher is only used once, and this, this is by Peter, while the term false prophets are used at least seven times in the New Testament by the writers of the New Testament. I'm not saying thereby that false teachers are less important than false prophets. I'm just of the opinion that uh, 
it's much easier to be moved into deception by false prophets who speak by in uh, um, by revelation who speak um, by what they have received personally and not necessarily something that is a deep scriptural study while a false teacher is somebody that puts together a system of teachings that would take you away from the truth now the word false teacher here means spurious teacher a propagator of erroneous doctrine okay so peter says we have a problem with false prophets but we will also have a problem with false teachers that will be among you now remember he's writing to christians he's writing about the fact that among the people of god there's always been false prophets and there will always be and also false teachers that will be um in the future and he says then that their purpose will be or their way of functioning will be to secretly bring in destructive heresies secretly bring in in the greek means to introduce surreptitiously or if you have to look at the dis- definition for that big word it means to introduce in a way that attempts to avoid notice or attention meaning you are introducing something secretively it means to lead people aside so he says there will be and we know out of what jesus and john said in the last days especially we will have this problem increase where people secretly where people are attempting to avoid notice and attention as they bring in things to into the church it was not god's intention for the church these heresies will be destructive the greek word here is damnable ruinous and pernicious or having a harmful effect especially in a gra- gradual or subtle way that is a problem of heresies it's something subtle it's something gradual in the beginning it's very difficult to recognize that we are sitting with something that's not from god and the word heresy in the greek means a choice a party disunion or a sect now we have to note how false ministers feed into disunity this is something we'll be able to identify in a setting when we see but why is there always disunity why does it does it seem as if things are not gelling it's often a sign of heresies at play and the integrity of our christian community is dissolved through the factions that are caused due to false teachings and revelations that's one of the ways by which we figure out but something is not right here while truth in love can bring us together and make us one in Christ because truth unifies us the opposite is heresies and lies cause us to come into disunity now heresies will ultimately bring people the scripture says if you read further in verse 1 it says Uh, who will bring secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the lord who bought them okay this is interesting heresy will always bring us to a point remember gradually because it's a secret brought in secretly it will gradually bring us into a place where we will be st- where we will start denying the lord jesus christ who bought us that word denying means to contradict to disavow to reject to abnegate or to refuse the moment things start contradicting christ we must know that it's probably a heresy that's busy taking us away from the very one that has brought bought us and then it goes on to say in the next verse in verse 2 it says and bring on themselves swift destruction people that come with heresy scripture says heresy will cause people to be brought brought into swift destruction the word destruction here means loss to die perdition waste or damnable those that perpetrate or perpetuate heresy those that perpetuate deception and those that live by these heresies or deceptions scripture says will be brought to swift destruction this is quite scary to to look at it doesn't say it's a slow destruction it says it's a impending 
it's a short time before destruction will come into those people's lives. And it's important for us to say that's why we want to stay away from deception. Because we don't want swift destruction brought in. Some, somebody's microphone is on. Please just switch off your microphone. Let me just see. Okay. Um, so... So it's very important that we stay away from deception for the very reason that it brings destruction into our lives. As, and then it goes on to say in the scripture, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. As, and it's interesting that he says here that many people will follow. Many will follow their destructive ways. That word many means many. And we have to understand that if we are in the last days where scripture clearly says that deception is a reality, that it won't just be a few people. It will attract plenteous people. It will attract many people. And the word follow there means to imitate, to obey, or to yield to. So many people are being brought into a place to imitate that which is not accurate in truth. Many people are obeying and yielding to a way of living, a way of Christianity that scripture calls heresy. And they will then participate in what scripture says, these destructive ways that brings perdition, that brings waste, that bring, brings ruin into their life. But the second problem is, that because of heresies, because of deception, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And this is so sad to me that the moment when we move into deception, God's truth, God's reputation, the kingdom of God gets blasphemed. That word blasphemed means to vilify. Vilify means to speak or write in an abusively disparaging manner. When people speak evil of, defame, defame, rail on, or revile the very things of God. And I, I look at where we have seen in the church, where the church has stepped away from biblical truth, where they have compromised, where they've been pressurized by the world to step away from very specific opinions concerning the word that the church has held for so many uh, centuries. If we look, for instance, at the whole thing of homosexuality, scripture is not unclear about the sin of homosexuality. And for many hundreds of years, the church stuck to their guns about what scripture says about it. And the moment the church started compromising and bringing in deception concerning that aspect and what scripture says about it, it's amazing to see how the vilification of the church has increased. Because the moment we move into lies, vilification is what will happen. When the church stood firmly, believing in scripture and proclaiming scripture, even though people didn't like it, there was a respect for the standard that people lived for. That vilification was not as, um, as, as we see it now, because the moment you compromise, there is a basis on which people can speak badly and abusively about the truth. Now, we have to understand that every form of deception does not just damage those caught up in it, but it damages the truth and the reputation of true Christianity. And God's word gets defamed. And this is terrible when this happens because the very source of truth, the very opportunity for people to be helped in their lives back into truth, into a place where they can be helped, is removed from them because of the reputation that is placed on Christianity in the eyes of those people. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of 2 Peter 2 now. We will look at that on a later stage where it gives us the characteristics of people that deceive. But I do want to move to verse 20, where Peter gives us then an understanding what the end process is of these heresies and of the deceptions that are allowed and have come into a specific setting. He says in verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So Peter shows us that when these heresies are allowed, when people follow these things, many people follow these things, the end of the process is that people get polluted by the world. People get right back into sin. 
and they are moving away from the knowledge of the Lord of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are, are again entangled in sin, and Scripture says their condition then is worse than before they met the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a terrible picture to understand that when we go into deception, the end process of that deception, if we allow in our lives and we do not turn from it, we do not see it, is that we will be worse off in sin, entangled in and bound by it than before we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it is so essential that we do not allow deception, that we do not be casual about deception because none of us wants to end up in that place. Deception takes people away from the only one that can help them escape the pollutions of the world. And every deception minimizes and at the end nullifies the sacrifice of Christ. This is so important for me to say this. In the beginning, it may not be sure that something is a heresy or that something is deception. But if you look and you see that there is a minimizing of the sacrifice of Christ, a minimizing of the position and the focus that Christ should have, it is just a matter of time where it's not just minimized, but where it's nullified, where Christ is taken out of the picture, causing people to get entangled in sin again, and to be overcome by sin, then no redemption remains for them, and their end is worse than their beginning. They are worse off than before they met Christ. All deceptions take us back into flesh and sin. It does not ever take us forward into Christ, his cleansing, and his deliverance from sin. This puts the fear of the Lord on me. We can get so fancy in our Christianity that we can lose the very power of the cleansing work of Christ in our lives. And that doesn't matter what type of deception you look at and all the different types that we get will always bring us back to this problem and this um, entanglement. Okay, so adding Peter's warning where he talks about false prophets, false teachers, destructive heresies and ways, denying the Lord, um, the truth being bla blasphemed and us getting back entangled into sin. Let us look at Matthew 7. Jesus is talking here again. And Matthew gives us some feedback on what Jesus said. Jesus gives an explanation of the kingdom. This scripture reveals to us that the way of the kingdom is through a narrow gate. He says, enter by the narrow, narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Few find it. This way that Jesus talks about is narrow. It means it is difficult. It is a way that leads to life. Yet there are few that find this way. This is so shocking for me if I think about this, that Jesus warned us that it's only a few people that truly find the narrow way, find the accurate way that God has meant for his kingdom. That word find means to get, to obtain, to perceive, or to see. Now, I want to be able to see the narrow way. I want to be able to perceive it and get it. But Jesus says few gets there. Humanly speaking, it is exceedingly difficult. I would say rather impossible for us, even as believers, to adhere to the way of life that God has called for us, that narrow way. In ourselves, you and I do not have the capacity to faithfully continue on God's path. If you think you have, you are probably deceived. Jesus says this way is difficult. It is narrow. Note the contrast between the few that find the narrow way leading to life versus the many Exactly what Peter said, that will follow on the destructive way, the broad way that leads to destruction. Remember, that's what Peter just said. Heresy leads to destruction. Many people will follow in that way. So just going by those two scriptures that we have now looked at tonight, that means that that which is most common in Christianity is probably heresy. Heresy. 
I'm wondering about that. That's just, Lord, help us. If you say many will follow in the ways of heresy, where, while few will follow in the narrow way, then we really need God's help and discernment in order to make sure that we are on the narrow way. You see, in the scripture, Jesus speaks in Matthew 14 about the narrow way. And immediately after that, Jesus follows with the following words. He warns us against false prophets again. He says in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Jesus is bringing the narrow road and the broad road concept immediately into the into relationship with the with the false prophets that we will encounter and he says because you know there's a narrow road and there's a broad road you now need to beware of false prophets because they come they appear to you in sheep's clothing in apparel in a garment in an external raiment that looks like a sheep but their true condition inwardly is that they are ravenous wolves. False prophets use external appearance to fool other people. They make themselves look like sheep to human eyes. They are creating a perception and an image that is not truthful. They do not allow their true condition to be seen by people. Their true nature and inward condition is enmity towards the sheep because what does a wolf do he doesn't spend time with sheep because he loves you know their company a wolf wants to be close to the sheep because he wants to feed on them he wants to benefit from them he wants to bring damage to them in the name of his own desires and so these are people that are not with the other sheep they are not true believers and followers of christ they are against those that are true believers and followers of christ they are in fact bent on consuming aggressively grasping what they want in their greed ready to extort the sheep to feed themselves they are the very opposite of the shepherd i think of the fact that we have spoken to black pastors or um, in our city in Pretoria, and we have heard how they say many people from other African nations come to South Africa, and the first thing they would do is they would open a church and say that they are a pastor. Why do they do that? Because they say it's the easiest way to make money. It's the easiest way for them to, to benefit themselves is they get followers, and out of that, they can feed themselves, and they can bring benefit to themselves, but it is to the detriment of those that they are so that they are prophets too they are false false prophets will be the vehicle by which the enemy will launch a spiritual attack against us this is what jesus is saying why because the enemy needs to prevent us from continuing on god's narrow and accurate path because if we continue on that path it will bring damage to his kingdom so can we learn to look past sheep's clothing and can we learn to see the true character, the truth of somebody that is coming as a prophet or a teacher into our community? Every road, especially a narrow road, is flanked by two ditches, one ditch on either side. And the devil's aim is to get us off God's road. He does not really care about which ditch we fall into as long as he can push us off the divine path and thereby block us from reaching maturity in Christ and becoming a threat to his kingdom agenda. And this is what we need to understand. Because God's way is narrow, there are dangers on both sides. And we need to understand how those dangers look like in order for us to stay out of those ditches, in order for us to stay on the road that is the narrow path that God has meant for us. Now, there are two main deceptions that if we have to simplify everything, we have to simplify it to these two ditches. There are always two opposite deceptions that await our Christian walk. These fraudulent alternatives have never changed and have always been raised up in opposition to the kingdom of God from the beginning of time. 
Now, I might, might be simplifying things a bit, but I want to simplify it. Otherwise, we will struggle to see the deceptions that are out there. And as we go further in the series, we can unpack more of the details. The New Testament church battled many falsehoods that arose and brought true believers away from the truth in Christ. Even the apostles themselves already saw many falsehoods come into the church. So it didn't take hundreds of years for these falsehoods to develop. They were there immediately. They developed immediately. That's why Paul, Peter, um, wrote John wrote so much about deception because this was one of the problems that they had to face within the church. Now, these lies always fell into, always falls into these two categories. There are two most dangerous deceptions that can greatly damage our Christian walk and cause us to go astray. And obviously, there's the small little deceptions that start creeping in, but it then develops to a full-blown deception that defines everything. The first one of these deceptions is the teachings that pull people into legalism into religions of religion of rules and the adherence to laws. Um, we see this especially in the books of, book of Acts. We see this in the New Testament church, how much the, the apostles had to wrestle, especially with the Jewish religious leaders and their insistence on the different laws that needed to be kept and insisting that those that became Christians even in the Gentile nations, had to become followers of the Mosaic laws. And we see a lot of writing in the New Testament about that, which we will refer to on a later stage. So, And the second this main deception, doctrines that, ex, uh, that comes into the church, are doctrines that excuses sinful behavior, allowing for man to do as he pleases, while using the grace of God as a pretext to not adhere to the standards of God, and his word. We have, for instance, the reference that we also see in the book of Revelations where John speaks about the Nicolaitans, a specific group in the New Testament church that caused a lot of problems. And part of their lie, their deception that they taught is that sin, certain sins only made you, uh, defiled you for a very short time. And if that time passed, you were holy again and you could continue being a Christian. They, I think they, for instance, taught that if you were immoral, if you committed the sin of adultery, you were only impure for seven days. And after that, you know, you were cleansed and you could continue. We see Gnosticism also as one of the mainstreams of deception and heresy that came into the church and in the first hundred years of the church. And there, Gnosticism is based on a personal spiritual knowledge. It's based on what you, the revelation is what you receive. It's not based on the orthodoxy of what scripture gives and of what Jesus Christ taught. So these two streams are always part of what is happening um, in the church and bringing people in deception, pulling people into these directions. On the one side, legalism with religion of rules, law keeping, works based. You need to do A, B, and C for God to be pleased with you. There's a lot of condemnation. If you don't do these things, you are condemned and you are not accepted. Versus the other side, which we call hyper grace where there's really no obligation on a so-called believer, where they really become lawless, casual about sin, where personal interpretation and personal experience is much more highly valued than what the word says. And where people just believe we are forgiven. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm forgiven. Both these are the two main deceptions that we are pulled into one or other way. In, in the church context. And we need to be able to start identifying these things and not even move into the direction that they will try to pull us in. Next, what's important for us to understand is to know ourselves. What type of person you are. Not all deceptions will necessarily have a pull on you, but because of our natural own personality, our natural tendencies and upbringing, often it helps us to know what we need to look out for, which one of these two falsehoods are the most dangerous for us in our personal lives. If you've been a naturally compliant person, uh, always listening and submitting to authority and following rules, you will most probably uh, 
be more easily brought into legalism than the other type of deception. On the other hand, if you tended to be a re rebellious person, always against the flow, always against authority and what was expected of you, then it's much more easy to fall into the deception of hyper grace, wanting freedom to express yourself as you wish. Um, then you are moving into that hyper grace place where um, you want the freedom without the consequences. You want to be able to lean on God's grace without having to feel guilty about any so-called sinful behavior. That's where we call people lawless, where they don't want any rules to regulate them. Obviously, we can also mix, have a mixture, because every one of these types of deception has a facet that um, normally attracts our fleshly nature and we can also find many times the paradox where these two things are mixed in a very strange way in deceptions that we see in the body of Christ. Both these lies are causing much damage in our modern churches, whether they are present in a small measure or whether they are developed into a full-blown system of thought and it directs every action in a congregational setting. In later sessions, we will look in more details at scriptures to unpack the biblical truth, truths that address these errors um, that threaten our walk in Christ. And, and we see especially people like Paul having had to write against both um, these heresies that, that had a, a, a presence in the New Testament church.